May I ask you to poke that white box on the bottom to make it go away? Thank you. So we have some new people, some returning people here tonight so that we can get to know everybody. Let's go around the room and do names. I'm Jim. Cecily. Vinayak. Ayush. Trevor. Thank you. Thank Sophia. Good. And welcome to our Zoomies. And I apologize for the uh, disturbance of the bomberites. Mm -hmm. So we are in the 18th chapter, the recapitulation of the whole teaching. And last week, we covered one of the most important teachings of Gita. It has come before. But again, in the recapitulation, it comes back. And as I was um, explaining to uh, Ayush that we're seeing these teachings of the 18th chapter through the lens of the three gunas. Tamas, inactivity, illusion, delusion, dullness. Rajas, activity, acquiring, achieving. Sattva, dawn activity, clarity, peace, contentment. We were looking at sukha, which is happiness. And I think we get some Western words that come from it. We get sugar, sucrose, asuka. All come from, I'm pretty sure, the same Sanskrit root, sukha, happiness. And we have some of the most beautiful poetry in the Gita in the explanation here. So, starting with the sattvic form of happiness, that which tastes like poison in the beginning, but then tastes like death. That which is rajas tastes like nectar in the beginning, but then tastes like poison in the end. <laughs> and tamas, that which tastes like poison in the beginning and the end. <laughs> so let's look at what we mean by that. 
So we started with this thorough understanding of happiness, of pleasure and suffering. And since Ayush is a Buddhist and many of you have taken Buddhist uh, Vipassana retreats, a clear frame for this is Buddhist Four Noble Truths. What's the first no Noble Truth? The truth of Dukkha, suffering. Life, the way most of us live it, is suffering. Now we're going to put physical pain on the shelf. That's not why most people blow their brains out. What is that suffering? What is the cause of suffering? Number two. Sangraha, attachment. Bama, craving. What does it feel like to want something you don't have? It sucks. Or the inverse. I want to get rid of something I don't like. Or what I call the neurotic form of it, I have what I want and I'm afraid I'm going to lose it so I can't enjoy it. And when desire and object of desire become one, when I get what I want, for a moment, my mind is free from its craving. But in my ignorance, I attribute that experience to the object, which then creates what we call a vasana. I think Goenka uses the word sankara. Is that right? That's just a, either a bastardized or a poly form of sanskara. Same idea means an impression left in the unconscious. And it makes me want to repeat that egoistic event. Noble truth number four. Oh, by the way, there's another state wherein we experience freedom from craving. All ordinary people experience it. Who can remember what it is? Deep sleep. Deep sleep. Everybody universally enjoys a deep sleep. Why do we enjoy it? The mind is not available to give us trouble. And the more screwed up my outer life is, the more I enjoy a deep sleep. And then if I have insomnia. Oh. Now, in yoga, we have a technical term for a particular mind state. It's called vasanananda. Vasana. I call it snooze alarm bliss. Alarm goes off. Just 10 more minutes. So there's just enough mind there to consciously enjoy. But what object is causing that? No money, no fancy house, no girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, or wife. That's causing it. The mind has yet to start its stupidity. And after 10 minutes, you go, oh, I've got to go to work. And, oh, I've got that meeting this afternoon. And, oh, I've got that problem, employee, I've got to deal with. Or, oh, I've got to, that faculty meeting I've got to go to with that idiot who's on the, the committee, you know. And, oh, what am I going to do about my child? You know, they're just going to ruin their lives. You all know that experience? And what happens to your bliss? Uh, Gone. Yeah. So you must have a mind in order to suffer. You do not need your mind in order to be blissful. 
Now, we're not going to stupefy the mind or make it insensible. That's not the goal of yoga. But we do learn a particular mind state of no mind, meaning I let go of the sangraha, the karma. And then the mind stays home. It's no longer a mind like it used to be. The Buddha said, a full path, we say, abhyasa, practices, yoga. Same thing. Same thing. Buddha was a good yogi. So how do we interpret those three ideas from last week? Or the sattvic mind, happiness that tastes like poison in the beginning and then tastes like nectar, is talking about mature renunciation. So, how many of you here in, in class have actually done a vipassana retreat? Most of you have. This is good. So, when you're sitting in meditation for 10 days, and all this craziness comes up. More, better, different. Give me, give me, give me this, that, and the other thing. What do you learn after a while? It never ends. Ignore it. And what else? <laughs> it goes away. It's the opposite. It goes away. It ends. Yes. <laughs> you need another retreat. <laughs> I didn't say that, Jim. It was me. But yeah. Oh. <laughs> It went away on day eight. Just That's you just, you just, you know. But the point is, the stuff goes away. And if, on the other hand, we reinfect the mind by acting on all that craziness, it just, it's, it's like, like, you know, you get drunk Friday night. And you wake up Saturday morning and you think you feel crappy because you've got the flu. Like, I'm just going to have a Bloody Mary because that'll make me feel better. And then the whole syndrome keeps going. So in the beginning, to sit there and do nothing, to just let the mind be, to practice mature vairagya, pronunciation. Talk about the definition of vairagya, that desire, we don't achieve it overnight, to give up all attachments without exception to enjoyments gained through the sense objects. Doesn't mean to give up the sense objects. You can't. The world is the world. The world's not problematic. It's my attachment, it's my sangraha. It's my karma, my craving. And to give up all identification with any form of self from the body up to including the superhuman God. So the other thing you will find if you sit in meditation on a retreat for a long time, you will find this thing called asmita, egoism, ahankara. Another form of ego. What what word do they use in in the Goenk things for for ego? Do they have a word for? It? What was the think. first word? Hmm. What was the first word that you used? Asmita. That comes from the Raja Yoga tradition. Just means egoism. Anyway, don't need. There are many words for it. But we see that in fact, it is a phony self. It is a shadow self. It's a counterfeit self. And when it falls away, we begin to see the ground of being that's my essential nature, which is birthless and changeless and deathless, which is like space. And the mind easily stays home. I've given up the world. 
Master Jesus had beautiful language. He said, I'm in the world, but not of it. So in the beginning, it tastes like poison, but in the end, it tastes like nectar. But for the rajasic per person, the desire of desires, in the beginning, it tastes like nectar, but in the end, it tastes like poison. I keep going after what I want. More, better, different cash and prices. A high that I get from an intense new love. I get attached to it. And then what happens down the road? Whoa! Why? Because everything in this world is temporary and finite. And if we grab onto it, we'll suffer. Some people weep, oh, I had a long-term relationship, it was three months. I know some of you have had parents who've lost a spouse after 40, 50, 60 years. Dudes, that's pain. There's no escape if you're attached. No escape. So for the rajasic person, first spoonful of ice cream is marvelous. You eat the whole damn carton. Ugh. You have a new relationship, call that take a hostage. Six months later, ah! get a brand new car. Oh, it's so sad walk out from the store and someone's keyed your door. <laughs> it's life. It's life. Entropy. Everything's falling apart. Everything's coming to be. Then there's the Tomasic ones of us. Uh, maybe you know some youngsters who are cutters. Any of you know anybody who's done that? Their pain is so intense that they cut themselves. So it's painful in the beginning and in the end. Or drug addicts. I know this is going to destroy my life, but I do it any way I can. I'm strong. It's painful in the beginning and painful in the end. And again, my favorite image, I think I mentioned this last week. Those of you who've read Dante's Divine Comedy in the third book, The Inferno. Dante is getting on the boat to cross over the river Styx. He sees the souls of the damned lined up on the banks of the river Styx, eager, happy, joyous. They can't wait to get into hell. Some of us have that in parts of our lives. So that's tamasic, suko. Very important section, very important section. If you want more review on this whole idea of where happiness is, what's intelligent, and this informs our renunciation, 
I would recommend go back to Viveka Chudamani, those of you who had that text, and look at the section on the Pancha Kosha, the five sheaths, and review the Ananda Maya Kosha of this sheet. All right, what verse are we on tonight? Did I have, was there a question out there? Yeah, Jim, I have a quick question. Yes. Uh, so it's about the tamasic state. Uh, I can understand the state of addiction, you know, in that a person is trying to escape their suffering by drinking, uh, having that Bloody Mary, like you said, or having some drugs. But uh, here, uh, I do also see some students that, like you said, you know, you cut yourself because you can't, uh, you, you're in so much pain and you want to punish yourself. This is something I don't fully understand because I feel like that's not even a release from suffering. You're consciously causing yourself more suffering. So why do people do that? Because they have tamasic minds. Their mm -hmm. minds are filled with deep spiritual ignorance, frequently because of childhood abuse, I see. of uh, uh, fear, they, they've developed some, some coping mechanisms as children, which become very non-functional as they become adults. Okay, thank you. A question about um, Jew attachments. Yes. And how they bring us suffering. So is it then better not to have attachments or is it better to have attachments and know that they will at some point make us suffer? Well, that's up to you. It depends on what your pain level is. I think just the idea of like not having any attachments, like to people I love and, to, you know, it just feels like to not have attachments would reduce a lot of the vitality. And a lot of the things. And that's an illusion. Okay. Swamiji was the most indiscriminate lover I know. He used to say, My love is like a fire hose. <laughs> Whoever gets in front of me gets lost in me. <laughs> but no attachment. And when someone moved away and another person was in front of them, they got all his love. So it is possible to love without attachment. Love is God loves. But your mind will tell you that attachment is necessary for me to feel loved and loving. And that's a delusion. Doesn't mean you will be without love. In fact, it will open your heart to an even greater love. Just put that on the shelf for now. Is that useful? Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions before we go on? All right. Mark, what verse are we on? Or Deepa, do you know? I've got Run. I'm sorry. I've got 40, Mark, what do you have? Yeah, I have 40 also. All right, will you help us out, Deepa? Sure. Uh, what page is that? In one of the books, it's 1,187. Also 789. 789? I don't know. I think it's easiest to find by chapter 18, verse 40. Chapter 18, verse 40, go. Natadasti Natadasti Prithviyamba Divi Devi Shuvapunaha Satvam Prakriti Jer Muktam Yadebi Syatri Birgunehi. There is no being on earth or again in heaven among the devas who is totally liberated from the three qualities born of Prakriti or matter. So the cell in all of us. And for those of you who had Buddhist background, this term Atman self, 
Buddha taught a doctrine of anatma, there's no self. In yoga, we say the jiva, the individuality, is unreal. But atman, hayamatma, brahma, the ground of being, the true self, the chit, the pure consciousness. That's your real self with a capital on this one. Anyway, capitalize. Can't write backwards. <laughs> Read the English one more time. I'm just having a startled senior moment. <laughs> sure, sure. There is no being on earth or again in heaven among the devas who is totally liberated from three quality from the three qualities yes. that is born of prakriti or matter. So Anything in the world of name and form, be it a mountain, a stone, a tree, a lizard, a frog, a lion, miserable human beings, enlightened human beings, at the level of the equipment, they all have some combination of these three rules. And they all exist in and are pervaded by consciousness. Now, this all becomes easy to understand if we go to the dream state. You are the god of your dream. What happens at night is a microcosm what happens macrocosmically? So when you go to bed at night, the first thing that happens is you go to sleep, which is non-apprehension of yourself as the waker. You don't cease to exist as the waker, but your mind is not aware of it. That's mini maya. Macrocosmically, the infinite covers the intelligence of beings. Then you awaken, as it were, into the dream state, where you have a dream body, which becomes a locus of perception. You peek out of the dream body's senses. You have a dream ego identified with that dream body. But outside, you have things and beings and situations. So let's say you're dreaming you're hiking up Mount Shasta. So your dream body, the dream friends you're hiking with, the dream trees and the dream mountain are nothing but the fabric of your mind. But the dream friend you're talking with is different than the stone on the mountain path. Both are nothing but imagination, but they're different in quality. The stone on the mountain path is tamasic. It doesn't think, it doesn't feel, you can say you're a stupid stoner, you know, it doesn't care. Trees, they are alive, they're growing, green they're birds going by, little more rajas. The birds have some sattva even, they can think and stuff like that. Friend, so you're the very wise friend with the diet. Lots of sattva. These three gunas appear in your dream, manifesting in various combinations as the people, places, things, and conditions. Yet, they're all made up of chitta, the stuff of your individual mind. Macrocosmically, we call that 
property, the stuff of nature. Now your chitta is really nothing but consciousness appearing as name and form. All of this property is in fact no different than consciousness itself. The world is not created. The world comes about like a very long and very vivid dream. All right, next verse. Brahmana Kshatriya Visham Shutranamcha Paramtapa Karmani Pravibhaktani Swabhava Prabhavergunehi of scholars or Brahma, Brahmanas, of leaders or Kshatriyas, and of traders, Vaishyas, as also of workers, Shudras, O Paramtapa, the duties are distributed according to the qualities born of their own nature. Now, we're stepping into some sensitive territory here. In the fourth chapter, and it's repeated here, Krishna will say, I am the author of the fourfold Varna. Varna literally means the color, as does the word caste in English past or hue. It has racial overtones. But the important thing to understand is Varna is not Jati. Jati is what you're born into. Janma. Our cast in the spiritual sense is not determined by your parents, what particular clan you're born into. It's according to guna and karma. Meaning, qualities of our minds and the actions So let's take it out of the ethnocentric view of South Asia and its historical context and look at it in a broader context. So I had a student many, many years ago, rest his soul, he's no longer with us. And he came from an incredibly wealthy uh, St. Louis, Missouri family. His family was in the oil business and chemicals. And he went to a, a fancy uh, Ivy League school with a master's degree in chemical engineering and stuff like that with the intention he was gonna go into the family business. Well, actually what he loved to do was word, woodworking. And it was an enormous risk and hard for him to do. Say, no, I want to be a cabinet maker. I want to make furniture, beautiful wood. And his thoughts, oh, I'm so disappointed in you. Have any of you done that? There was this huge expectation from family and you like went against it. So when you find your own truth, then you will find that it will roughly fall into these four categories. Krishna never says, Brahmanas are better than the Vaishyas. That is sociology, that's human opinion. The Brahmanas were better than anybody. No, if you have a scholarly mind, 
if you're attracted to religion, if you enjoy doing ritual, if the spiritual life calls to you, then you have a Brahman temperament, <clears throat> according to this. If on the other hand, you're a warrior, you have to stand for justice. You must speak truth to power. You just can't stand by when injustice is being done on any level. You become an attorney, you become a soldier or a judge or a political activist. And your temperament is Kshatriya. No matter where you were born, whether you're Indian or Western. Or you may be concerned with the production and the distribution of goods and services. It's a noble calling to make stuff. It's good for people. And your temperament is Vaisha. No matter what your jati you were born into, you may have the sacred thread and stuff like that. But if you're involved with the production and distribution of goods and services, that's Vaisha. Some of us prefer the life of working with our hands. We like labor. We're attracted to the trades. You know, one of the big tensions we have in this country right now, you know, the, the assumption is if you want to make a good living, you need to go to college. Well, what if that's that what calls to you? What if you want to be an electrician? Or enology, you want to move to Sonoma and grow wine. Nothing wrong with that. But you would be a shudra. Now that's been all twisted in India. So if you're a Brahmin, someone else is a shudra, they have the idea, okay, you wait on me and I'm going to pay you shit pay. And if you're good at it, then you'll get to come back as something better next lifetime. That's nonsense. Swamiji railed against this wrong interpretation of the caste system his whole life. Nowhere in Gita does Krishna say that caste is according to Janma? He says, Guna and Karma. So, how do you figure this out? In many professions, we do go into the profession of our parents. For example, Many of you know I'm a retired professional musician. In many, many homes where there's music in the home, my mother played the piano, my father had a great interest in music, we grow up getting these sons calls as kids. So it's frequent that people who become world-class musicians came from musical families. Or even in politics, we have Bushes and Kennedys and families that, that where this idea of public service is inculcated at an early age. And it's in many, many professions. But it's because the children are drawn to it because there's a waggy finger, you need to do this. That's not what it's about. So I love the language that J. 
Joseph Campbell uses. He talks about following your bliss. If you want to know what you're supposed to be doing in life, pay attention to what doing that you do brings you joy. So back when I was teaching music, I could tell you who was gonna be a successful professional musician in about two or three weeks. And it was not necessarily the ones with the most beautiful voices who taught singing. It's the ones who practice. When I walk through the music building, you know, at six, seven o'clock at night, it's the same kids there in the practice room. Just having a great old time practicing. I can't tell you how many kids I know who work all day in IT, and then what do they do when they get home? Rub the computer. They love it. They just love computing. Do you know any people like that? Yeah. They're drawn to it. It's not work, it's fun. Work is the highest form of play. And play should be the highest form of work. So this is how we find out what our varna is, not what you're born into. Any thoughts on this? It's a very important teaching. Now, unfortunately, this idea of Swamiji's where he would rail against the birth-oriented form of the caste system, even which in my mission, that's started to fade and finding that stratification return, which is hard. Any thoughts, any comments? Next verse. Shamo damastapa shaucham Shantirrajava mevacha Gyanam vigyanam astikyam Brahma karma swabhavajam Serenity, self-restraint, self austerity, purity, forgiveness, and also uprightness. Knowledge, realization, belief in God are the duties of the Brahmanas born of their own nature. So if you are born into a family where you get these spiritual sanskaras at an early age, for example, in Swamiji's family, when he was very young, every evening they would do puja to Lord Shiva. And he just intuitively created a game of just in his mind's eye, trying to visualize the face that was on the Murti on the idol. So, for those of us who are Westerners, how many of you were very religious when you were super, super young? You love to go to church, you love to do the rosary, and you love the ritual. Did you do that as a kid? Yes. You did, enjoyed it. Yes. Yeah. Well, you probably had school friends, oh, church, I, I hate going. Yeah. Right? <laughs> See, at an early age, those spiritual sun stars were emerging. Others of us, we have some sort of a big shift in life. <clears throat> and we come to this late. Swamiji had that very early training. Then when he got older, he became an atheist. Thought it was all superstition. Walked away from it. Went to school, got degrees in literature and law. He was into money and fancy clothes and showing up in, in country clubs and stuff like that. And then 
he had heard about this saint, Ramana Maharshi, I think he was 18 at the time. He was on the train, so he got off at Tiruvannamalai and went to see him. At Darshan, he talks about there's no place to sit. So he walks up to the front, the satsang front. But the one is lying on the couch. If you've ever been there, there's a couch. And he had his eyes Bala, that was his name. He sat down in the front row. Ramana Maharshi just opens his eyes. He's right in through his eyes. Closed his eyes back and smiled. Him up. He hypnotized me. No. A decade later, when he went up to Rishikesh, he began to really deep. Explore the picture path. Well, there's no saying when these things fructify. But the marks of a person with these spiritual vasanas are enumerated in this list. So let's go through them. What's the first idea, Deepa? Serenity. Yeah. So Shankar will say in his qualifications of a fit student, kind of preparation for all this, is enough understanding of the world outside and a knowledge of the world inside. So you've got to see what the world can give and what it can't give. You give up foolish expectations of the world. And you have some awareness of your own inner psychology. Those of us who may have studied Yoga Sutra, anybody here read Yoga Sutra? Chapter two, Sutra two, if I can remember. Tapas Swadhyaya Shura Pranidhana Kriya Yoga. Yoga in action is tapas. Doing austerities. Then he uses the word swadhyaya. In our tradition, we usually think of that to mean our study of the scripture on our own. Patanjali means an inventory, an awareness of our psychological character strengths and character defects. That's swadhyaya, self knowledge. And then Ishwara Pranidhana, trustful surrender to God. So here we have some serenity because we worked out the major parts of our psychological issues. You can do this in a lot of ways. You can do this by going to a psychotherapist, you can do this doing breath work, you can do this through all sorts of various spiritual and psychological tools. But you've got to be at peace with your own mind to some degree before this work starts to be finished. Next idea. Deeply, you're uh, muted. Self restraint. Yes. So, self restraint here, we got layers and layers and layers. We have to be able to discern the difference between what I call the inner two year old 
and our real heart's deepest desires. Most of us are tyrannized by the indulgent part of our mind. I call it the little two-year-old. Where did I see it? Um, I was in the market and there was this woman with their child. And they were about two or three and literally lying on the floor, shrieking. And the mother was like pulling the kid along the floor by the arm. <laughs> no! That little child still in all of us. Must have it this way. I know what to do that. Indulgent part of the mind. We need to attain to yoga arudha. Yoga arudha. Arudha is a riding term. Any of you been horseback riding and you've gotten on top of an unruly animal? You know, you've got to really collect the reins, you know, just you have to let the horse know who's boss. They'll take advantage of you. So, so you need to mount the steed of the mind. So we're not tyrannized by the indulgent tendencies of the mind. Now, if any of us have ever tried to break a really bad habit, you know, find it this is easier said than done. Try quitting smoking or giving up sugar or any other issue. All right, next idea. Austerity. Yes. So the word here is tapas, usually translated as austerity. There is no virtue in austere practices for the sake of austere practices. What is tapas? It literally means heat. The mind is ruled by the law of inertia. The law of inertia is that a body at rest or in motion will stay at rest or in motion in a vacuum until energy is applied to change it. So we have these sanskaras or sankaras, as Goenka said, these grooves literally in our brain. So we have habituated ways of behaving and thinking. Now, those of you who are psychologists, psychotherapists, may not agree with what I'm going to say. Yoga says, understanding is the booby prize. Understanding why you're a basket case doesn't stop you from being a basket case. It doesn't work. But, we keep writing the check with the psychotherapist. Yoga says what you need to do is behavior modification, physical behavior and mental behavior. This is called tapas. Why do you drink? Oh, I drink because my father was abusive. Now let's process that. You're not going to stop drinking until what happens? You stop drinking. You plug in the job. You may need to go to a rehab to be separated from addictive tendencies. But nothing changes if nothing changes. So Tapas is when we go through that difficult and painful 
change. Change in behavior. Changing thinking. May I talk about your process a bit with your permission? Yeah. So Susali and I have talked about it one time. How much weight did you lose? 60 pounds. 60 pounds. Mm -hmm. And diets didn't work. So you got into FA, correct? Right. So what was one of the tools that you had to take up in FA? Calling people. And in the food itself, what did oh, you have to do? Measure and weigh. Measuring and weighing. Who here measures and weighs your food before every meal? What is FA? Food Addicts Anonymous. Oh. Yeah. But that's toughest. And I bet that was really hard in the beginning, was it? <laughs> hard in the beginning. Pardon me? Yes, it was hard. And it's probably hard in the end, <laughs> and hard in the middle, and hard in the end, right? <laughs> but it's tapas because the mind has its habituated groove. You know, too much of a good thing is marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> And it's with anything in life, with anything in life. So some schools say we act our way into right thinking. Some of the metaphysical schools say we think our way into right acting. Yoga says, yes, both are true because the mind and the body are merely a subtle and gross form of the same thing. What needs to happen though, is change. And what's going to happen when you try to change your behavior or you take up the discipline, I'm going to give up thinking in a particular way. Let's say you had an unfortunate love affair and you have the habit. How could he have done that? How could she have done that? Oh, and nobody knows how badly I did. Do you ever have those kinds of thoughts? <laughs> no amount of understanding is going to make them go away. What makes them go away is to turn the mind into a more fruitful mode. Or, who oh no, Jim, I drive by the bar I used to drink in, and I just can't help it, you know. Why don't you go home a different way? <laughs> <laughs> Gee, I never thought of that. Like, drive home a different <laughs> way. Don't drive home by the bar, you know. <laughs> Duh. Make a change this is tapas this is tapas when you use the term tapas is this like a kind of discipline or like a different way of well it's discipline in the truest sense discipline comes from the same root in english as the word disciple and scissor so it's not self-punishment kind of discipline it's sublimating a lesser desire for something greater that you want. Does that make sense? Um, so tapas is different from tamas. Tamas means indolence. Okay. Tapas with a P means heat or austerity. But what I want to impress on you, how are we doing on time? We're fine. Is many people think of all austerity as being a goody goody, and we do these things so other people can see them. So it's Good Friday, and you know, you don't put on any makeup, and your hair's a mess, and you know, you're all bedraggled. God, you look like a wreck. What's the matter? <laughs> oh, I'm fasting. <laughs> you know, it's so everybody else knows it. Uh -huh. You know, I know it's God bless her, love her to death. Her name was Rose. She's no longer with us. Little Filipino woman. Good Friday. 
we would do Stations of the Cross. I'm, I'm a retired church musician. Rose in her 80s needed to do Stations of the Cross all the way around the church on her knees. But she sure as heck made sure everybody saw her doing it. <laughs> oh, God. oh, how religious. <laughs> And Christians don't have a monopoly on this. Hindus, Muslims, everybody has what I love the term Trumpa calls it spiritual materialism. Almsgiving. Oh, God. When I used to work at the Grace Cathedral, I'll never forget this when you're in the, the great choir. You know, right going up to the altar, emblazoned in gold and the marble. It's a big medallion. It says, to the glory of God and the memory of William J. Crocker. No. <laughs> <laughs> Same size. Oh, God. <laughs> I just want to make sure everybody knew who put up the money for this. Is that charity? All right, tell us what's the next idea? Purity. Sauchum. Uh, Shamo yes. damas tapam shauchum. Yes, shauchum. Shauchum. Cleanliness, literally. But again, it's not so much about taking a bath every day and making sure your clothes are washed. The real cleanliness is purity of mind. Can we have fewer thoughts than necessarily goody goody thoughts? Can we develop the discipline to return good for evil? And then again, going back to the teaching of the Master Jesus, in Judaism, there are lots and lots of dietary laws and purity. You know, you can't mix certain foods together and stuff like that. Some foods are not kosher, you're not allowed to eat them. And stuff like that. And Jesus said, a person is defiled not so much by what they put into their mouth, but by what comes out. So sochum here uh, means purity, literally means cleanliness. Uh, most of us need to be brainwashed on a regular occasion. Got dirty minds. All right, next one. Next Forgi idea. Forgiveness. Yeah. Forgiveness goes hand in hand with the issue of resentment. And there's that old, old maxim, resentment is a poison we brew for another and drink ourselves. The person who is hurt the most by hanging on to resentment is you and me. It is a stain. If you hang on to deeply rooted, long-term resentment, it will also in the end probably make you sick. So we have to learn to let it go. How do I do that? Well, another old slogan, you spot it, you got it. You point the finger at someone else, there's three more pointing back at you. So for a moment, bring to mind someone in your past, maybe your present, that you resent. Now, look to your own life. Have you ever behaved that way? Maybe not to the degree they have.
Why did I behave that way? That's the next question. Why did I respond with anger to hurt someone or ignore someone? Almost always, it comes back to some form of self-centered fear, which is a deep soul sickness. Why am I frightened? I'm frightened because I see a meaningless universe. I see a meaningless universe because I'm in competition with God. But once I understand what my own motivation is when I act like an a-hole, then I have understanding of other people's motivation. And then they stop being evil to me and they become spiritually sick. People who are flawed, and who are suffering. And I can begin to have some empathy. Doesn't mean I have to like their behavior. I have found that's the best tool for letting go of deeply rooted resentment. Any thoughts on this? Jim, I have a thought slash question on this. Sure. I feel like sometimes, well, I wonder what your thoughts on this. I mean, I think sometimes these three emotions are also stuck in the body, right? You also have to process it through the body first because just thinking about it, is actually like, I understand that this is what you have to do, but I feel like for me, at least, I need to feel it in my body first and process through my body in order to let go of that resentment, for example. The body and the mind are not separate. Some of us do better with somatic processes. Others can do better with thinking it through and reasoning it. We're able to get a deep release of it. It's, it's you know, deep somatic body work is not the answer for everybody. But it may be for you. Yeah. It may be for you. Thanks. And one of the things about the body, this is why I loved being a professional singer, your body doesn't lie. Mm -hmm. You can think you're through something. I can, can't tell you how many times I get ready to go on stage and I think, you know, I've done this a million times. No performance anxiety, I'm fine. And then I head straight to the bathroom with diarrhea. <laughs> Laugh, guess what? Still have performance anxiety. Body doesn't lie. So when you have that disconnect between the, uh, the mind and the body, the body is telling you the truth. Mm -hmm. All right, next one. Forgive, uh, uprightness. What's the word in Sanskrit? Shantir rar arjava meva. Uprightness, straightforwardness, having integrity. It's very important to show up in this world as a woman or a man of your word. So what makes the world work is when people have integrity. When you say you're gonna be someplace at four o'clock, be there at four o'clock. You can't be there at four o'clock, ask yourself what's going on. You're going to say you're going to do a favor for someone and you don't do it. Why? What's that about? If you do not have integrity, this uprightness, you disempower your son culpa. People who feel powerless and impotent in the world, frequently, it's because they lack integrity. Their thought, their speech, 
their action is not in alignment. Do you think that's codependency? Pardon me? Do you think that's codependency in a way like people codependency in my definition mm -hmm. is when I'm uncomfortable and I think it's somebody else's fault. And therefore, I attempt to fix somebody else to make myself feel better. But we can talk afterward about that. All right. Next one. Uh, let's see if we can finish this verse before we end. Knowledge. Jnanam vijnanam cha, right? Yeah. Knowledge and understanding. So. Yanam here means uh, indirect knowledge of the path and the goal. Other scriptures will call it paroksha jnana, indirect knowledge. I have a theoretical understanding. Then here Krishna says, vi jnana, vi is a superlative. It means Transcendence, sometimes it means opposite. As it's used in Gita, it means understanding and direct experience. So it's not only understanding, but direct realization. So here, and the woman, clear understanding about what's real. Next one. Realization. Yes, we talked about that. Jnanam Vijnana. Next idea. Belief in God. That's the last one. Yes. So what do we mean by belief in God? One of the terms I love, which again is used largely in Buddhism, is Mahamudra. Who's heard this term before? Who can tell me what a mudra is? It's a hand gesture. Okay. Yeah. Now, in tantric forms, or you'll see them even in, in all religious traditions, you'll see archetypical hand gestures. They occur everywhere. What they are intended to do is invoke energy. Actually, that's not as the deep understanding. The deep understanding is the energy itself moves our body into archetypical gestures. So, for example, anybody here in management and had to interview people for jobs, what happens if you come in and the person sits down like this? What does that say to you? What they're literally doing is blocking off chakras. It's a mudra. But it communicates. Or you go on the dance floor, love to watch people dance. So much is said by the way they dance. Some people lead through their forehead. <laughs> Others are the ones who stay in. <laughs> oh you know you see people do that those are mudras those are that, mudras what does that say about them don't you <laughs> it's where their energy is going and coming from okay All right. yeah <laughs> got it the ha means great <laughs> the entire universe is the maha mudra the great response to intelligent energy of the infinite. Jung tuned into this when he talked about synchronicity. So the same intelligence that's got you sitting in my living room or on the Zoom machine is also spinning galaxies and pulling suns into a black hole. It's all connected. Swamiji used to say it's a cosmos 
not a chaos. I promise you, when you wake up tomorrow, light will still move at 186,000 miles per second. That will change because it's the Lord's Sankalpa. So what a yogi wants to do is understand that it's all God. It's all going to work out. And fall into this divine flow. I can't, he can, I think let him. God's not an underachiever. God does not need my stupid ego messing things up. All I have to do is go look at my desk, see what a mess it is, my imagination. That's the little piece of the universe God lets me have control of. It. Thank God. I'm not in charge. So this belief in God is not so much just, oh yes, I know there's a God, but this deep Ishwara Pranidhana, trustful surrender to the intelligence of the infinite. You don't have to put a name on it. They can be a black box with a question mark. One of the things we have in Hinduism, we have Vishnu Sahasranama. What does Sahasranama mean? The thousand names. Lalita Sahasranama. Thousand names of the mother. In Islam, 99 names of God. But name and nama, that's the word in Sanskrit, is also the nature of something. It's not just Joe or Bill or Ted or Mary. So it doesn't matter what name you use. And it can change. But it's important to trust the process of God. Okay, I've gone over. I apologize. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vishishate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Sri Guru Pyonamaha Hari Om Thank you all. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Tikka. Thank you.